Hi everyone, welcome to Bite Size Med, where we talk about quick, bite-sized concepts in medicine for study and rapid review. This video is on the countercurrent mechanism. If you haven't watched my videos on osmolarity and transport of solutes through the nephron, I'd recommend you watch those first to help you understand this video better. The links are in the description box below. The kidney has millions of nephrons, and each nephron has a glomerulus and a renal tubule. The first part of the renal tubule is the proximal convoluted tubule, which then leads into the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and finally the collecting duct. The renal plasma gets filtered through the glomerulus. The water and solutes that pass into the tubule can then get reabsorbed or secreted or neither and just get excreted. To understand the countercurrent mechanism, you need to know osmolarity and diffusion. Osmolarity is the concentration of a solute in a solution. Water moves towards a higher concentration of solutes to dilute the osmols and the ultimate goal is equilibrium. Solutes diffuse from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, again to bring back equilibrium. So the kidney has a cortex and a medulla. The loop of Henle and the medullary collecting ducts are in the medulla. Around 25% of nephrons are juxtamedullary, which means their loops extend deep down into the medulla. They have a specialized capillary system, which is U-shaped, surrounding them, and this is called the vasorecta. The loop of Henle and the vasorecta make up the countercurrent mechanism. So first we're going to look at the osmolar changes that take place through the course of the nephron. The normal plasma osmolarity is 300 milliosmoles per liter. When the glomerular filtrate is initially formed, it's isoosmotic with the plasma, which means it's 300. Through the PCT, equal solute and water get reabsorbed, so it stays isoosmotic until the end of the PCT. Next comes the thin descending limb of the loop of Henle. I told you that the loop of Henle is in the medulla, so the descending limb is less permeable to solutes but is very permeable to water. It reabsorbs water into the hypertonic medullary interstitium. Now keep this in mind because I'm going to come back to it and tell you why it is hypertonic. So since water is getting reabsorbed, the osmolarity of the urine increases until it reaches equilibrium with the medulla. So the fluid is getting concentrated from the loss of water. Next, the ascending limb. This portion is impermeable to water, but reabsorbs solutes. So solute is being added to the medullary interstitium while the nephron keeps water. So that increases the tonicity of the medulla, and thus the urine now is getting diluted. The dilute urine enters the distal convoluted tubule, it's now hypoosmotic. In the early DCT, there's more reabsorption of sodium and chloride, so it becomes more dilute. In the late DCT and the cortical collecting duct, there's further reabsorption of solutes, but this portion is impermeable to water without the antidiuretic hormone. So without ADH, large volumes of dilute urine pass through and get excreted. To conserve water, the kidneys concentrate urine, so that requires two things. First, a hypertonic medullary interstitium. Second, the antidiuretic hormone. So with that background, we're now going to look at the countercurrent mechanism. The plasma osmolarity is 300 milliosmoles per liter. So to understand the countercurrent multiplier, we're going to use this schematic diagram of the loop of Henle with its thin descending limb, the thick ascending limb, and the medullary interstitium. The fluid that enters the loop of Henle from the PCT is isoosmotic, so 300. Let's put 300 through the loop. Assuming the medullary interstitium at this point is also 300. At the thick ascending portion, Solutes get pumped out into the interstitium through the triple transporter. 
So the osmols in the lumen will come down up to a 200 gradient, which means that the difference between the medulla and inside the nephron is 200. Because below that, ions will diffuse back to keep it at this level. So 100 is lost to the interstitium, which means the medulla is now at 400 and the lumen is at 200. So the medulla is now hypertonic. The fluid now coming down the descending limb has to give up water until it reaches 400. And it does that. Water gets reabsorbed. It reaches 400 and then goes back up the ascending limb. Again, solutes leave. So here around 50 goes out and it becomes 150 and 350. And here 100 goes out, so 300 and 500. It's not the amount that moves out that matters in the end, it's that the 200 difference gets maintained. So now the medulla is at 500. Again, water reabsorption happens until the osmolarity in the descending limb becomes equal to the medulla, so 500. It repeats over and over until the medulla reaches up to 1,200 to 1,400 milliosmoles per liter. And this is why it's called a countercurrent multiplier. The ascending limb keeps adding solutes, and the descending one keeps fixing the equilibrium by reabsorbing more water. So the countercurrent multiplier creates a cortico-medullary osmotic gradient, which means the osmolarity increases as we move from the cortex to the deeper medulla. But what happens in the DCT and the collecting duct? Since the fluid exiting the ascending limb has lost solutes, it's now dilute. It's hypoosmotic when it enters the DCT. The early DCT just adds to it. It reabsorbs sodium and chloride, but is impermeable to water. And then it reaches the late DCT and collecting duct. Now the antidiuretic hormone shows up. The ADH acts on the late DCT and collecting duct, increasing their permeability to water by creating water channels so that water can be reabsorbed and the urine can be concentrated. Without ADH, the dilute urine is just going to keep getting more dilute. But with ADH, there's water reabsorption and urine concentration. So you would think that the water reabsorption should be diluting the hypertonicity in the medulla. Importantly, this portion happens in the cortex, so the medullary hypertonicity is untouched. The water that gets reabsorbed then gets back into the bloodstream and thus the kidneys make concentrated urine. Another substance that can contribute to medullary hypertonicity is urea. The ascending limb, the DCT, and the cortical collecting duct are all impermeable to water as well as urea. 40 to 50% of urea gets reabsorbed in the PCT. Depending on the antidiuretic hormone, its concentration changes in the medullary collecting duct. When ADH is high, water gets reabsorbed. So by the time urea reaches the medullary collecting duct, its concentration is high. This portion has urea transporters, which can shift urea into the interstitium, and from there it diffuses back into the descending loop of Henle and goes through the nephron till the medullary collecting duct again, because the rest of the nephron is impermeable. So it keeps recirculating, and each time it does, it's creating a hyperosmotic medulla. That's the loop of Henle, but where's the vasa recta in all of this? The blood flow to the medulla is important. The flow is low and slow, and that ensures the uptake of solutes into the bloodstream is slow, so the medullary hypertonicity stays. The vasa recta is like a circulatory connection between the cortex and the medulla. It's highly permeable to solutes because it's a capillary. As blood goes down the medulla, solutes keep getting in from the interstitium from high to low, and water leaves, so it's getting concentrated, reaching almost 1,200 milliosmoles per liter by the time it reaches the lower portion. But then it loops back, and as it ascends, the opposite happens. Solutes leave, and water enters. 
So the Yule loop is what prevents excessive flow of fluids and solutes. And that is the countercurrent exchange. And the whole thing together is the countercurrent mechanism with the goal of concentrating urine. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.